Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. I am not, uh, I'm not a bit surprised that the average age in this room is probably in the mid-20s. This is unusual for a for think they there are a couple of old guys like me here, and I'm welcome. We're glad to have you here. But most of this is a young audience because this is a young, this is a, what's dynamic for the rising generation, and we're going to have a real opportunity today to listen to Dr. Gill. I want to say uh, first of all, my name is John Hamry, I, the president here at CSIS, but I'm really going to count on Dr. Jim Lewis, who's going to lead the conversation with Dr. Gill in what I think is a, is the cutting edge part of American foreign policy these days. It's what is our future uh, as an innovation society. Um, national security used to be defined in old-fashioned ways. How many aircraft carriers you have, things like that. It's very different now. National security ultimately is about the vitality of your society, the strength of your economy, the creativity of your ideas industry. And we're fortunate today to have an individual who is right at that cutting edge of creativity in American uh, business and, and science. Uh, Dr. Gill is a, a graduate of MIT. He, of course, heads the IBM Research, which is probably the premier research institute in the private sector, in the profit-making private sector in, in America. He's a big believer in collaboration as a strategy for innovation. And you'll probably hear some of that today for the, the, the organizations that he's helping to create and to lead. It's a unique opportunity for us to get an insight into a world that is going to affect all of our lives in a very constructive way going forward. So, Dr. Gill, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Jim, why don't you get us going? Thank Great. You. Thank you, John. Uh, welcome to CSIS. So I was thinking about this this morning. Actually, I was thinking about it last night. About a century ago, there were uh, a series of breakthroughs in physics, even a little more than a century. And it took some time for those to translate into the technologies that created the digital revolution. Right? We're at the cusp of the same thing. In fact, we're well beyond the cusp. So watch the physicists, and then 20 years later, something happens. That's a good motto. But one of the questions that we'll talk about, I hope, is um, is the pace accelerated? I mean, when you think of like Rutherford or some of the early physicists, it was decades before their stuff showed up in technology, in commercial use. Will it be faster this time? My bet is yes, but we can talk about how. Part of it is just awareness. I mean, you didn't have this kind of awareness of the importance of technology, as John was saying, for national security, for economic strength, for foreign policy. So we're in a different environment. And I think one of the things that we'll talk about today, I hope, is what do we need to do as a country when it comes to uh, quantum technologies, quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum communications, where the US stands, and what we can do about it. So you want to throw anything in? I have a long list of questions. There will be an opportunity for people to submit questions uh, we ask that you do it in writing so we can throw out the crazy ones. And um, <laughs> you'd be surprised. Uh, <laughs> and people online, of course, have the opportunity to submit questions as well, but Dario. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me here today. And thank you, John, for a kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be with all of you uh, to discuss a topic that is extraordinarily close to uh, my heart, but more importantly, incredibly important for our future. As, as it was described. Um, with quantum, what we're witnessing is nothing short than a true revolution in the nature of how we create and process information. Um, this is perhaps and arguably one of the most exciting times in computing since the advent of the first digital computers in the 1940s. And the reason for that is because uh, with quantum information, we are revisiting the very foundation of what is information. We have built a modern edifice of technology uh, based on the idea of the bit, right? the binary digit, an idea that traces back its origins to um, the Renaissance, really, to with Leibniz, who, as a creature of that moment of rationality, uh, was inspired by the notion that we could translate all human knowledge into binary digits and we could apply reasoning 
to assist humans to uh, perfectly understand the world. A very sort of like enlightenment idea. <laughs> he didn't have the means to make that technology real. And it wasn't until Cloud Shannon in the 1940s that introduced what is now known as information theory, that the idea of the bit, the binary digit was introduced and the means with which we could reproduce information perfectly through communication channels. And there was a companion idea to that thought of information with Moore's law. And if you fast forward to today, the ability to create, store, communicate bits at ever lowering costs and performance is what has created the modern digital world. Well, with quantum, we go back to that foundation about what is the origin and the nature of information and we revisit it. And we revisit it by incorporating ideas from quantum physics uh, in, in, in this case to enrich the ways in which we can represent information. So instead of having just two states, zeros and ones, we get to have a much richer way by exploiting principles of superposition and entanglement and interference, things that we are borrowing from quantum physics to create a mechanism with which to compute that is going to allow us to solve problems that we couldn't uh, even touch with classical computers. So we are indeed in this unique moment where the technology is becoming real, but is based on an intellectual journey that has been many decades in the making. And, uh, and I think for that reason, it, you know, we all feel, those of us who are participating in the field and also from a policy perspective, that we gotta pay a lot of attention to this topic because the implications are profound, but the progress is, is very real. Yeah, and you violated one of my rules, which is we're not allowed to say entanglement, but we'll forgive you this time. <laughs> it's so complicated. Let's start with the sort of basic questions here. Where does the US stand in quantum technologies? And maybe I should just do a footnote. Everyone always thinks quantum computing and quantum encryption, but you've also got quantum sensing, which is entering into commercial use, and quantum communications, where some countries may be ahead of us. So there's multiple flavors of quantum, but overall, where would you rank the US? I would say we are in a, in a leadership position. Mm -hmm. uh, you are rightly, uh, rightly pointing out that the field of quantum technologies is composed, broadly speaking, of three areas, sensing, communication, and computing. I think in, uh, uh, in the area of quantum computing, we are uh, without a doubt uh, a leader in that world, uh, but with very significant, uh, you know, <laughs> competitive pressures, let me put it this way, right, <laughs> on, on that topic. Um, it's, um, if you look at, for example, uh, within the context of, of China as an example, they had made very significant investments over the last decade on quantum communications and they had done important demonstration with satellite technology of creating, an, you know, your band word of entanglement, entangle, uh, you know, qubits to be able to send uh, over long distances. Um, but I think I, my observation is that thanks to the progress we made, for example, a company like IBM and others in the field on quantum computing, there was also a shift in strategy as an example to pay more attention to computing and make bigger investments in computing because that was also a field that was fast moving. So, so we see an interplay between the advancements in a very competitive global landscape on these three fields. Uh, but in the context of computing, I would say United States uh, at present is in a leadership position, uh, but um, not also a moment for complacency. I think there's very significant uh, public policy and you know, private investments that need to be uh, accomplished to, uh, to ensure that we lead in both in the commercial and national security space. So let's stick with China for a minute because it's a complicated picture. How do you assess their efforts in quantum? And what is it, Missius? Is that the name of the satellite? That was the Missius satellite. That's they have right. some cool stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, um, so I'll you know make some comments specifically China, but but also more more generally. Look, uh, a decade ago, uh, I don't think quantum uh, would have been in the top ten list of priorities for most nations, right? Honestly speaking, that has changed, right? And 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 I would say for all leading nations right now. Quantum technologies is definitely in the top five. Uh, I think, what would I put in there? I would put semiconductors, I would put artificial intelligence, I would put quantum, 
I would put biotechnology, I would put energy technologies, right? Like uh, to put a relatively short list of technologies. So, so first, we see that is in the top five. As a consequence of that, we see aggregate levels of spend on this topic that now are measured in the many billions of dollars, mm -hmm. right? So we're in a, in a different regime, and China is no exception, right? I mean, it's a huge priority. As I mentioned, they had put a lot of eggs in the basket of communication and demonstrations around these sort of secure communication channels using uh, quantum entanglement. But we have seen in the last five years massive investments on the computing side, uh, both on superconducting technology and you know, ion-based systems. And I think they have made, frankly speaking, quite a bit of progress uh, on, on that front. But I, I, the reason I'm not singling out you know, China specifically is because in this broader context of all leading nations uh, doubling down on this technology and having an appetite and a desire to invest um, you know, for, for future leadership. And China is not, not an exception on that. Can I have a geek moment? Because Of course, my thing. favorite moments. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one thing, so I've looked at the coding you need to do for quantum computing. It's very different from the coding that we're used to. What are the skills you need? How's coding different? What, what are we going to need to do? I mean, usually, I used to say the side that had the most physicists wins, but now I'm not sure. It might be the side with the most coders. So, Yeah, I, I think I would segment it. I would tier it at three different levels. There is a level of coding that is very, very close to the machine, like very low level. And uh, for example, in the world of superconducting technology is about engineering the pulses. The way a quantum computer works is, in, in our case, we use a technology called superconducting qubits that operates at cryogenic temperatures, you know, very close to absolute zero. And the way information is encoded in those qubits is by sending these exquisitely controlled pulses of energy, in this case, um, you know, five gigahertz frequencies, and control the interactions in the qubits. So if you want to code at that level, you have to know something about quantum physics, about the nature of pulses, and control them at that level. So that's like low, low level. One level up is algorithms. You want to develop a new algorithm, you have to also live at the intersection of the world of quantum physics and algorithmic development and mathematics. So that also requires knowledge at that level. But one level up, at the level of a developer, you don't need to know any quantum physics. That's the world I live in. <laughs> and the majority of people in the world will not need to know any quantum physics uh, to be able to benefit from quantum computers. In fact, our point of view, and what we've been doing at IBM, is to democratize as much as possible the technology and not try to create new languages or anything like that. We created uh, with the community an open source environment called Qiskit, which is the most widely adopted open source environment in the world. And it allows you to just uh, operate by using you know, standard methods and, um, and, uh, and environments, and you write your program. And all you need to know is that quantum computers exist, and you need to be able to call upon them to perform operations or calculations that are well suited to your task. But that is our view. Our view, in the end, is people will use the programming languages they're accustomed to, and they'll just benefit by quantum computers uh, without having to know quantum physics, unless you need to make contributions at the algorithmic level or at the low level, which is a subset of the community, right? Maybe like a fraction of 1% of the developer community. So one thing I thought was neat about some of the stuff IBM is doing is the idea of quantum as a service, which is that you don't, we're gonna talk about the chandelier, but you don't actually have to have a quantum computer, you just need to be able to access it. Is that accurate? That's right. Mm -hmm. So we did something very neat that uh, I, I think is very strongly linked to the emergence of a new industry, uh, which is that in May 2016, we put the first quantum computer on the cloud. Right? And that didn't exist. It was a five qubit machine. And we allowed anybody that you know, had access to a computer to just write a program and do their own hello world example. right? <laughs> and, and that was really powerful because prior to that moment, the number of people who had touched a qubit, maybe there were a dozen laboratories around the world that had the ability to create a qubit and do some kind of experiment. And then we allowed anybody to be able to write a program, click go, and you would send the zeros and ones over the internet, we would convert to these microwave pulses, and we had a quantum computer 
in Yorktown Heights in New York that allowed people to run experiments. And we didn't know how many people would be interested in this. But within a week, we had 3,000 plus people. And fast forward to today, there's half a million people that have run over 2 trillion uh, quantum programs on our computers. We <laughs> operate at uh, present uh, over 25 quantum computers uh, on IBM Cloud. And, um, and basically, there's been over 2,000 scientific publications that have been generating using our computers. So there's now a whole community that is able to write programs, run them, right, uh, without having to know anything about like how to operate the quantum computer and benefit from these new capabilities. So that has created a whole new way to experience the technology and a whole new way to understand how the industry is evolving. So tell us about quantum computers. Uh, you, you the joke name the nickname for the IBM quantum computer is the chandelier because it does look like something out of East Germany in 1970. What's a quantum computer? So a quantum computer is a machine that is able to uh, create these qubits, these quantum bits, and be able to manipulate that, those qubits in a way that performs a calculation exploiting the laws of quantum mechanics. Just in the same way that a classical computer is a machine that creates and manipulates bits, uh, zeros and ones. There are different ways to implement quantum computers. Um, we implement them using um, superconducting technology that basically allows us by creating a new device that is something you know, a little more, more geeky called a transmon qubit, which is a Joseph of Junction. Basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a small structure that is about 100 nanometers by 100 nanometers that has a metal and an insulator and a metal. And it allows us to create what essentially feels like a virtual atom, a ground state and an excited state that we can control with these microwave pulses that I talked to you before. So by having this two-level system, we can then create circuits, I mean, a combination of these uh, devices um, that at present have hundreds of these devices, so hundreds of qubits, and to be able to then, as a result of that, create these special properties uh, that over time will have an exponential advantage compared to classical computers. So a quantum computer is composed of the device that implements the qubits, the packaging that puts it all together, the wiring that allows us to send the microwave pulses in and out of the system, and the control electronics that generates these pulses, that generates these control signals. All of it is enclosed, um, so the, the processor and the wiring is in a cryogenic system um, that cools down. But in the end, we're able to create systems that, um, you know, the famous chandelier is, is uh, it makes the point that you see these beautiful cables uh, that have this gold, uh, you know, plated in gold color that indeed looks like something like a 19th century artifact. It's both the past and the future. It looks something <laughs> entirely different than a, than a normal classical computer. So that's what has become very famous and well known for that sort of like look. But in the end, we encapsulate them so you just end up looking into sort of like a glass enclosure where you see this hanging uh, you know, metal cryostat and the control electronics and the gas technology that makes it a self-contained unit. But it doesn't look like a laboratory anymore. I mean, we have put now systems all over the world. Mm -hmm. We have a system uh, in the Cleveland Clinic that is in the lobby of a building. So what used to be something that was a laboratory is a self-contained glass enclosure that works you know, uh, around the clock. So it's come a tremendous way in terms of the maturity and the sophistication of the technology. So we talked about quantum as a service. And what that means to me in some ways is you're not, if you have, you have a smartphone and the smartphone is more powerful than the supercomputers I used at Argonne National Labs 30 years ago. You're not going to have that. We're not going to have quantum computers in our pocket. No, we're how, not. How much are they going to cost? So we're not, uh, we're not because of these special properties uh, that are required to exploit and create these effects that uh, give them their power. So the mode that we will consume them, but by the way, that's the way we consume most of computing technology today, yeah. is that they're going to reside on data centers or in an environment, and we're going to take advantage of very fast connectivity uh, combined to our edge devices or laptops to exploit their power. 
I mean, we're accustomed to that already, right, in the world of cloud and cloud computing, and this will be not an exception. So the, the as a service element of it is means like we render that computing power in the form of APIs that allows anybody to both develop and exploit that capability, integrate it into applications and models, et cetera. So, but I don't think we're gonna feel any sense of loss uh, <laughs> that we don't have to run a, like a giant cryogenic system in our backpacks or anything <laughs> like that. But the, let's touch on cost, because that'll be a good lead into Congress and policy. What do you have to spend to get one of these things? So uh, these, these systems uh, today right, are in the you know, many millions and tens of millions of dollars or so. But what one has to contrast it is um, what are you comparing it against? And the way the technology mm -hmm. is evolving is you're comparing it to calculations that you would have to use supercomputers against. So those supercomputers are in the hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Or like they can be billion dollar projects like Fugaku in Japan and so on. So the journey hmm. of where quantum is evolving is that it's actually gonna be much more energy efficient and cost efficient hmm. than classical supercomputers to perform a specific set of tasks. Um, so, so that's sort of the capability around that. So the, but the appeal of it is that um, it's extraordinarily more efficient. In fact, at some point, it's not even a question of efficiency. It's just simply impossible to do it with like classical machines. Mm -hmm. So then the cost comparison would be essentially it's like an infinite cost, right? Because no matter how much money you would be willing to spend on a classical computer, you couldn't get there. So, so there's actually a tremendous energy and dollar savings associated with mapping a class of problems that we care a great deal in the world to these very specialized form of computers. Yeah, and it turns out that's more of a, it, people used to not think about energy consumption uh, when it came to I know, and now it's like a yeah. huge, huge topic. I mean, uh, on specialized like microprocessor design, the idea of power performance was very mm -hmm. central to sure. it. But you're right that now is entered to a regime where the energy costs associated with computation is growing in a, a kind of an unbounded thing, mostly driven by AI, frankly. Mm -hmm. But if we keep going in that direction and you just extrapolate naively, like you would just forecast that in 20, 30 years, we would use all the electricity in the world just to run computers, right? And that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it might be fun though. Um, so on turning, you're in Washington, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> turning to policy and legislation, let's start with a broad question. Is the US doing what it needs to do and it just needs to do more? Or is there something else we should be doing? I think, I think there, well, the, I'm going to answer yes to both questions. Uh, so on the first one, the, the things we're doing well, as far as quantum is concerned, is it is, again, it is obviously a huge priority. Uh, so I don't think there's like a level of like agency across the United States, whether you're talking NSF or DOE or NIST and so on, that they wouldn't say quantum is a huge priority. I think uh, we have seen uh, an important step a few years back with the National Quantum Initiative getting mm -hmm. passed. Uh, we were very active supporters on that. In fact, I'll tell a small anecdote that like, we, we brought the famous quantum chandelier. It was the first time that I entered US Congress and we brought there to, you know, a number of years back to, to educate uh, policymakers on this topic. So that was a really good act uh, that did sort of like I would say it's like a foundational investment. It supported, it was mostly being implemented through the DOE uh, National Quantum uh, Centers, of which there are five. Uh, we at IBM participate in three of those fives. It brings national laboratories, universities, private sector together. But what I said it did well, it would be at the level of supporting individual investigators, you know, PIs, uh, supporting students. So let's say it's like the foundational sort of like science effort of the field. What I think, and, and, and what we gotta do is more of that. So we, there's a moment right now where it needs to be reauthorized. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important for Congress to reauthorize the National Quantum Initiative and appropriate the funds to extend that. But that's not enough. Mm -hmm. So the part that it is missing, it is the field has advanced that what we need is a new set of capabilities for the nation. And that specifically is in the form that we should undertake the ambitious goal of creating a quantum-centric supercomputer or multiple of them. And, and what is the difference or the contrast between NQI 
and what I'm saying right now. The other one is at the level, like I said, of supporting uh, faculty, researchers, kind of, you know, the talent side of the equation, the basic research side of the equation. But a capability is something different. Um, in high performance computing, Summit, Sierra, Frontera, things like that are a capability for the nation that were developed for the uh, National Laboratories of the United States or the National Science Foundation. And as an example of the impact of the capability of high performance computing, it was, for example, the reason why we do open air nuclear testing of nuclear weapons is because they can be simulated. The nuclear stockpile of the United States can be simulated using high performance computing. So that required very singular infrastructure, very large projects with hundreds of millions of dollars of investment to end up providing the best computing environments in the world to perform mission critical uh, applications as well as supporting uh, scientific endeavors in the national laboratories and the university system. Well, just like we were able to build high performance computing systems using CPUs and now AI accelerators, it has become time now to design and build quantum supercomputers. And here we're not talking anymore about a single processor or a single machine. We're talking about large scale systems that will have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of qubits that combine the best of classical computing, the best of CPUs and GPUs with the best of quantum working together. And that strategy, that vision, the ambition to build them and, and to make sure the United States is the first country in the world that creates them and deploys them to advance our scientific, economic, and national security goals is a missing goal. And, and so now it's the moment to uh, engage in, into, into that activity. During the G7, um, we uh, announced, along with the University of Chicago, uh, as well as, uh, in this case, with the University of Tokyo, an effort uh, with a commitment from IBM with a $100 million investment to support research and education activities and design activities towards this goal of building a 100,000 qubit supercomputer by 2023. But, you know, this is about now in the community now, from university to labs to private sector, to go and embark on that goal. But it's a hybrid computer, right? It has both conventional and quantum. It's a hybrid computer. Uh, quantum computers require classical computers to work. They work in concert. So it's not correct to say quantum computers will replace classical computers. They're just going to work in concert. And a quantum-centric supercomputer we will, will exploit a lot of classical computing combined with a lot of quantum processors working in concert. I'm a little nervous about asking more political questions because your handlers will have a fit. But what's the reaction on the Hill when you go up and say this? I mean, generally people like science. When it comes to writing the check, sometimes it can get sticky. But what's the reaction on the Hill? Look, I, I think that, um, so if we go back to the passage of NQ, NQI, the National Quantum Initiative, it was passed with you know, tremendous amount of bipartisan support. So I would say that this is not a topic that mm. uh, has been politicized. I think it is seen as a topic that is a huge strategic priority for the United States. I think there's a lot of appetite to learn more. I mean, it can, it can come across a little bit like, what is this and why does it matter? So there's an effort of explaining its relationship to our economic success and our national security success. And um, so, so I, in general, I see uh, uh, broad interest. I think that there's a lot of work still to do, and I very much appreciate the opportunity today to discuss this topic, to uh, be more ambitious as to the possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, as you asked me the question, um, I think NQI uh, reauthorization is essential, but not enough. And so I think we're still in the early stages of the dialogue on what is a more ambitious set of objectives for the nation around this. And, and I think leading on this world of quantum supercomputers and to see that that can be a broad set of alliance across the public sector, mm. the uh, nonprofit sector, the private sector in accomplishing that goal is in the early stages of that discussion. But um, we gotta make progress because frankly speaking, that's where the competitive side comes in. Like if we don't move quickly enough, I think that that's where we can have the opportunity to lose the current leadership. Before we came on stage, we were talking about what it was like under Eisenhower, who was a great when it come, president when it comes to S&T. 
and the role of defense in the Defense Department and national security and pushing technology in the 1950s and beyond. What does it look like now? Is it DOD? Is it NSF? Do we need something new? Uh, I think that, uh, that's a great question. I mean, um, we obviously saw uh, following the uh, World War II with, uh, you know, Bannever Bush as an example and the famous Endless Frontiers, um, uh, you know, position paper, we saw a, lot, a huge moment of institutional creativity, right? We saw the creation of the National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm. We saw the establishment of what would become the National Laboratories, right, to eventually the Department of Energy. Later, we saw the creation of agencies like NASA and DARPA and so on. So in this current moment, I think what it also calls for is perhaps not so much about do we need new federal agencies, but what is the mode in which we're going to create science and technology? One huge consequence uh, that I think has been very uh, beneficial as well is that in addition to the indispensable role that the federal government uh, provides on, on the support of basic science and core technology is the role of the private sector. I mean, in the United States, the R&D sector is a $600 billion enterprise. 70% of that spend is in the hands of the private sector. And on some of the most important technologies for the welfare of our nation, um, like semiconductors and AI and quantum, is particularly the case. So what I think the moment calls for, too, is what are the set of policies that is going to allow us to pursue important national objectives, like what has happened with the Chips and Science Act, right, with um, the reshoring of mm -hmm. semiconductor manufacturing and reinvestments on things like the National uh, Semiconductor Technology Center, or in quantum, policy objectives like creating a network of quantum supercomputers, or in AI, uh, enabling the universities to have access to state-of-the-art computing so that universities can be at the forefront of a field that today, frankly speaking, they struggle even to reproduce the results mm -hmm. that are happening in the private sector. All of those are important policy objectives that is going to require the allocation of federal investment but in its execution, it's no longer in the form of, well, you know, uh, one federal agency go and implement this, but it's by necessity going to require that we partner and come together to create those capabilities. So it's, it's a how question that I think needs a lot of creativity. This guy is too smart. He keeps jumping ahead to questions I'm supposed to ask later. Um, but I'll start with one that leads into the international and private sector part. China has a very different model when it comes to innovation, when it comes to government investment. How would you describe their model? Where, where does it have strengths? I mean, the Chinese clearly have some strengths. Yeah, so I would, I would say uh, a couple of areas where I see, I see strengths. So first of all, in its, its, in its commitment to um, educating scientists and engineers. Um, I think that if you look at the aggregate uh, output, of course, even, even uh, adjusting for population, they have obviously made a very significant mm -hmm. commitment to ensure that they continue to invest in STEM and educate at all different levels uh, scientific and engineer leaders uh, around that. In the United States, um, we have a lot of work to do to ensure that we continue to educate and train the best uh, you know, scientists and engineers. One of the things that is an enormous strength and a blessing in the United States, and you know, I mean, I'm an example of being a beneficiary of that as, a, as an immigrant to the United States, is, um, is being able to attract and be able to um, you know, engage with some of the most talented people around the world in our educational system. However, there are secular trends that the degree of dependency Right? For example, uh, Chinese students in the United States represent about 30% in the STEM field of, uh, you know, in many of these areas are important. Uh, will that be, will we always have that level of dependency on China, STEM talent in the United States? Will that change over time? Remains to be seen, but I think it would be prudent to assume that we're going to need to strengthen uh, the ability to continue to attract students from a diverse set of countries into the United States. And equally importantly, that we double down on our commitment to educate you know, domestic talent 
uh, particularly with a commitment also to represent the great diversity that we have in our nation uh, in these fields. And frankly, on that area, we have a lot to do. So that's one area that I see of strength. I think the other uh, area in, uh, in, in China is that indeed they, um, they select particular areas of technology and they can devote a very significant resources with focused effort. To be fair, not always with great success. I mean, on semiconductor technology, they have had a lot of struggles uh, on, uh, on that effort. So I am much more uh, a believer that we actually have extraordinary strengths in our system in the United States uh, in, in, in doing that, so long as rem we remain committed to do a few things, to invest in our talent, to commit to our world-class infrastructure and to have you know, clarity that there are certain technology areas that are extraordinarily important for economic and national security priorities, and to have to invest in scale on those and not spread the peanut butter on everything. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so long as we do that and we remain an open um, country that attracts the best talent, we're gonna be in great shape. You talked about the importance of the private sector, and it's really true. Uh, I saw a statistic, I've seen it twice now, that of the 17 technologies uh, considered critical for the military moving forward, uh, 14 or 15 of them are developed in the private sector. Where does China, does China have companies that you watch, or is it all government labs? No, there's definitely lots of companies that, uh, that, uh, that we watch and that we have seen. And uh, that also obviously have huge investments and commitments to, uh, to all of the areas that are those priority areas. Again, like, uh, like I mentioned, I don't think the list of the technologies that are priorities varies a great deal among leading countries. I think there's broad consensus of mm. what is the list. And obviously, you know, all, uh, all countries that uh, care about science and technology um, invest you know, uh, aggressively on those areas. I think we need to remain confident on the strengths that we have, and we just have to pay a lot of attention that I think in science and technology policy, what is really important is to enable also to have consistency, right, on support. It's very bad when we have moments of like huge enthusiasm and then very low, uh, you know, levels of support because the process of science is, is a long one, right, and it's a process of discovery and iterating in the scientific method. So we need to have a bipartisan support that has long and sustained commitments where the aggregate level of investments around that needs to grow because it's gonna be the source of productivity, right? And the source of uh, also um, you know, national security differentiation. So, so long as we remain unwavering in that commitment and, uh, and focused on the technology areas that are gonna make the biggest difference in addition to supporting basic science and basic scientific research, um, we will be in good shape. Um, so what will be very unfortunate is like if in the normal like political wrangling, science and technology investments are an element that pay the price on something that, you know, I think there should be broad agreement that we need to sustain them no matter what. Just like this high degree of consensus on national security matters, by and large, right? Uh, I think we should have science and technology investments in the same category as a, something fairly sacrosanct that, um, that, is, that properly channel is for the well-being and the support of our nation, right? I, we did a podcast with Australia's chief scientist a couple weeks ago, and she had an amazing factoid, which is Australia has 0.3% of the world's population, but she said they have 10% of the world's quantum scientists. Uh, when you look at Australia, when you look at the European Union, where do they stack up in this? It's not just US versus China. Yeah, that's right. So I'll just give you a little bit anecdote to just give you partial validation on the Australian point. Our head of the quantum program in IBM, Jay Gambetta, who is you know, now American sitting, but is of Australian. Uh, this, and just to, as a minor point of validation of the Australians uh, influencing very strongly the quantum <laughs> field. Um, so uh, what countries are, are, have had a strong uh, track record on this? So you know, in addition to the United States, Canada has had always also mm. very strong um, investments in this area. You mentioned Australia as well. Um, in Japan, there's been a lot of focus uh, in this area. The, the very uh, origin, for example, of superconducting, um, you know, uh, 
uh, qubits originated actually the first example of that in Japan with, uh, with now Professor Nakamura when he was at NEC at the time. Um, and then obviously on basic, uh, like I would say today, uh, in Switzerland we see a lot of great work uh, going on in universities. Over the last decade there have been a lot of efforts in the Netherlands as well. Um, and, you know, and, and of course, you know, many contributions in places like Germany and UK. But um, there's been, I, I would say, you're, you're right, that in Australia there was a, there's been a kind of disproportionate amount of people who have done really good theory work and experimental work as well. That's an example. Yeah, I, uh, it was an amazing fact. And Australians tend to believe they're going to be leaders in the commercialization of quantum uh, beyond computing. So I thought that was really cool. Let me turn to some of them. We got a fair number of questions, so let me turn to some of them now. Um, what are some examples of exciting and unique projects in quantum technology? And that, you can do compute or you can do sensing, you can do communications, you can do. So look, um, since you're bringing up communications, I'll give you an example of something we're really excited about. Is actually the feel of quantum computing and quantum communication are gonna combined very significantly. Mm. Um, one way quantum communications has been framed was perhaps, you know, over time as this ambitious idea of creating a quantum internet, right? A new set of links that create quantum information to create perfectly secure information transfer over a large number of links, etc. But well before that, which is a long-term, uh, you know, dream and effort, we are going to see quantum communication links present on these quantum supercomputers. So the way we will build quantum supercomputers is we will have many quantum processors that need to talk to each other. And the way to get the maximum advantage of the computational power of these quantum processors is if the links connecting the quantum processors are quantum communication links. So simply put, we will need to have qubits that are in this processor, and qubits are in this other processor, maybe many meters or tens of meters apart, being able to have this entanglement, these qubits that can span multiple processors. So that's going to be a fascinating technological endeavor to take the advances that are happening in the field of quantum communications and bring them into the field of quantum computing, and vice versa. Quantum computing will have a big impact on how we will build networks uh, of quantum communications. So um, I'm very excited about that, about the fact that um, these fields are going to be converging by mm -hmm. having the shared project of creating a quantum supercomputer, as an example. Maybe a follow-on to that. Someone asked to uh, talk a little bit about what IBM's doing in quantum sensing, quantum communications. So we do a lot on the communication side in connection to what uh, I just discussed uh, in that we've had long-standing research efforts and many collaborations about now this demonstration of qubits to qubits talking across many processors. And we are developing links that are going to have different uh, distances. Some of them are going to be just a millimeter apart. Some of it will be centimeters apart. Some of them will be meters apart. So each one requires different links, different technologies, to be able to have information being exchanged in such a manner. So a lot of activities on the communication and the computing, much less so on the sensing side, right? It's been uh, not a priority for us. So uh, that's not to say that the technology we're not creating will not have an impact to that world of, of sensing, but our priority has been on, on computing, and first and foremost, and now in communication as a result of the desire to build quantum-centric supercomputers. Why is that? Is that because IBM is IBM and it's synonymous with compute? Or? I, very well said. I like to actually say that the, the story of IBM over uh, you know, 110 plus years has been the story of computing and its relationship to institutions, to business, to government, and professionals. So, so it is the story of, of, of computing and, and what it has meant. And so it's kind of in our DNA uh, <laughs> to, uh, to focus on that. If you haven't done it, check out a picture of a computer in uh, 1890, which turned out to be a room about this size filled with desks and people in front of adding machines doing basic math, insurance companies and banks. And they were replaced, these business machines were replaced this is, by the way, part of the AI story, by your, your devices. 
Now, you don't see people on Wall Street standing outside buildings holding signs that say, we'll compute for food. So I think computers, that, computers was a profession. Was it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Computers it was, was the name person. of a profession, like yeah. saying an architect. I'm a computer. Yeah. It was, was like saying I'm an architect, right? It's the people who computed. And uh, l only later, when it was replaced by the machines themselves on the process, they got associated with that. So it's a kind of an interesting evolution. Yeah. And the um, follow-on question, um, what's IBM doing uh, when it comes to quantum-proof encryption? And we've had people mm. from NIST here who've done some really good work. We've done a lot of pioneering work. Uh, so, so first, let's frame the nature of, of the problem. Why, why does it matter? And then this is a huge priority for us of making the world quantum safe. The one of the most famous implications of quantum computing is the fact that over time it will break asymmetric encryption. And asymmetric encryption works in the following fashion. Uh, you, uh, let's say the two of us, uh, you and I have two private keys, and we want to exchange information that is encrypted. Because let's say you're the bank and I'm the customer, and you want to give me like, you know, my account balance, and I want it encrypted and no one else to know. The way that gets done is that two private keys get generated that happen to be prime numbers. So let's keep it very simple. Let's say your private key is three, mine is five. The product of those two numbers is 15, and 15 is the public key. The public key is open, everybody has it, including the bad actors. So it turns out that if you just have the public key, it's very, very hard to determine what are the two private keys. When the number is 15, it's trivial, it's three and five. But if the number is sufficiently large, it turns out it's exponentially costly for a computer. So those are the kinds of tricks that cryptographers love because verifying the solution is very easy, the product, but the reverse direction is very hard to compute. That's the idea of asymmetric encryption. Well, uh, in the 1990s, there was this um, researcher who was then at Bell Labs called Peter Shore that published a very, what now is uh, you know, known as Shor's algorithm, that basically said, look, if I could formulate this problem um, with this idea of quantum information, and we had access to this future technology called quantum computers, if they were sufficiently large, I could solve that problem exponentially faster. So that generated a tremendous amount of interest in the community and a tremendous amount of implications. Because now, fast forward to today, we know for a fact that now we're going to have to change the encryption protocols with which we secure the modern digital world. The good news is that there's an answer to that problem, which is the process that NIST has been engaging the community in, of saying, let's develop new algorithms that don't rely on that technique of factoring as a means to secure digital information. Um, Long story short, there were hundreds of proposals that were put forth by some of the best cryptographers in the world, and it was narrowed down last year to five, uh, of which you know, four out of the five were co-developed uh, by IBM Research, right, uh, working with collaborators. So now we're in the process of finalizing the standardization of that process, but the important task now is we're gonna have to go to everywhere where we have used asymmetric encryption discover where we're using it, and substitute it with the new algorithms. Now, the algorithms do not require quantum computers to run. They're gonna run on normal classical computers. They're not going to impose more overhead than classical encryption methods, I mean, the traditional encryption methods. But it does require, I mean, you know, sometimes the analogy is like, you remember the Y2K? I don't know, many of you are too young to remember. <laughs> but like, there was this big moment of Y2K that when 99 to 2000 uh, was gonna convert, it's gonna, was gonna create havoc on uh, many computing systems. So there was this effort of discovering, patching, and so on. Well, we're gonna have to go through the process of migrating the world's encryption systems to the new protocols. So the mission of IBM Quantum actually is to fall, we take it so seriously, is to you know, make quantum computing useful to the world and make the world quantum safe. So we have a huge initiative and effort, both on software and in consulting, to help institutions, government, companies, to discover where they have this cryptography. So we call it the cryptographic bill of materials, just like you have a software mm -hmm. bill of materials. You say, where are you using cryptography? Let me discover it for you. Let me then help rank, based on the criticality of the application, where we should migrate it first, 
and then let me help you do the migration aspect of it. The last thing I'll comment about this topic, too, is that some people would say, well, but how urgent is it, right? Uh, because, okay, we don't have large-scale enough quantum computers to break encryption yet, so shouldn't I just wait until I encounter that future, right? Maybe five years from now, 10 years from now. And the answer is that that's a really bad idea uh, because the pattern of attack will be the following. Um, for things for which we want to preserve that information in an encrypted fashion, certainly all national security endeavors, but also in the industrial sector as well. Um, the pattern of attack would be storage is very cheap, so if I'm an, uh, a bad actor, what I could do is take your encrypted information, store it, and just save it. Just save it. Like, you know, storage is very inexpensive, so I'll just keep it there. And in the future, I will decrypt the past. I will just take all the information I've stored, and then I will use future versions of these more advanced quantum computers to decrypt all the things I've been storing. So every day that we don't migrate to the new protocols, it's a day that there's nothing we can do in the future to protect ourselves against it, right? Mm -hmm. And so therefore, since the journey is gonna take a while, <laughs> It's very important that we start migrating our most important information to quantum safe protocols. So that's the urgency. And that's a standard trick that people have been doing since the 1950s. Record it, store it, and eventually figure it out. There used to be, I don't know if it's true, but people used to kid there were a bunch of boxcars parked out in front of Fort Meade, and we always thought, ah, oh, they're filled with computer tapes from stuff they had recorded. So um, that's one reason why it's interesting to look at China is that the Chinese could get there before we do, and that would be really exciting. Uh, maybe we'll get there at the same time, but you, we've seen this movie before when the transition from DES to AES, and it took about 10 years. You think it'll take 10 years this time? Uh, well, so De Digital encryption standards, certainly advanced gonna, encryption so, standards. So I'm hoping that for the most mission critical things, we move a lot faster than that, but on aggregate, it will take 10 years and more. Like, but I mean, getting all of this across all institutions all over the world is a huge endeavor uh, that we gotta make a lot of progress, but it doesn't, it doesn't get done overnight. What do you think the greatest challenges are for quantum development in the near and distant future? At its core, there's two, I would say two, two things I would highlight. One is dealing with errors. Uh, yeah. uh, errors of, are, of course, present in uh, classical computers, too. But uh, thankfully, there's a technique called error correction that is a means to be able to detect errors and, and, uh, and, uh, and suppress them in both classical systems. And it also is true for quantum as well. But dealing with errors um, and ways to mitigate them uh, there was a very important publication that the IBM team did very, just a few weeks ago, I was on the cover of Nature, was around exploiting this technique of error mitigation, right? Be able to characterize errors present in the device and be able to mitigate them. Uh, this is well before you even do things like error correction. So I would say error, dealing with errors is a big, big uh, focus uh, for, for us and for the field. And then the other area is, is uh, algorithmic development and uh, use case development because the wrong way to approach quantum computers is to say, well, I have these algorithms that I'm accustomed to uh, in the classical world, and uh, I just want to use a quantum computer because I've heard it's faster you, or better. You're you, a little more positive on error correction than some of the other commentators I've seen. Yes, that, yeah. we are. Uh, mm -hmm. We are at IBM because we, 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 ha we take the point of view that the way the technology, and I think it's bearing fruit on our strategy and the progress that we're making, that we are gonna see this sort of continuum of we're gonna build generation after generation of quantum computers. We build, you know, we move on a new quantum processor, uh, whole new generation every year, and within that many revisions. And that what we're gonna do is gonna build devices with better coherence, better error rate, and then implementing these techniques of error mitigation, error suppression, partial, over time, partial error correction, and then full error correction. So we see this continuum that from our perspective, what the user wants is, can you compute more and more, giving me accurate results? So the fact that you're not implemented full error correction, they don't care so long as you're giving them good results. So we're going through this iterative process of extending the length of the computation, the quality of the computation, the scale of the computation, by using a host of techniques. 
So, so we do not take the point of view that there is zero value and then infinite value when there's a fault-tolerant quantum computer. We say the goal, it is indeed to get to a fault-tolerant quantum computer, but we're going to get through this sort of continuum process of better and better machines that handle errors better and better and better until we get to that point. And, and just for background, the Y2K thing wasn't that scary. One of the things was on your spreadsheet, if you put in 2,000, a lot of times it would show 1,900, which, you know, like a century off, who cares? But um, the other one was if you put a, uh, I think, an arithmetic calculation in some chips, it gave you the wrong answer. That was a little more exciting. Um, so error correction will be crucial, and it kind of leads in. This is the second to last question, and it's really maybe a little geeky. Um, could you address reliability, predictability, and repeatability for computations exploiting entanglement? I could not answer this one. <laughs> well, uh, so one of the ways you handle that, right, because it's a, it is a probabilistic aspect, right, that is inherently present on the calculations that use quantum information, mm -hmm. is but you have you to repeat the calculation many times. Oh, do you want to explain that a little bit, the probabilistic part? Yeah, so in the end, like, you know, one of the implications of quantum mechanics is that you're, you're dealing with a world of probabilities, right? So when you perform a measurement, right, you, mm. you, you, you get an answer within a probability distribution, and to get, like, a discrete answer in the end, like, let's say you're multiplying two numbers, you have to repeat the answer enough time to accrue statistics to give you, just like in the same way in classic probability with dice, right? We know that if we roll the dice many times, we end up with a probability you know, for example, with coins, mm. we'll end up with a 50-50 probability, but you could perfectly well have, you know, 10 times in a row heads, right? And there's nothing that violates it, but you need enough statistics to get you to the right probability. So in quantum, it's the same. So the way we deal with that is by you iterate and you just submit the measurement many, many times. So there's this notion in our quantum computers of shots, and shots is like the number of executions, so programs will have 1,000 shots, 10,000 shots. And that means is you're running it many times to the computer to accrue the statistics. So that's how you, and, and in the end, you end up with a confidence factor. You say, that's the answer, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm confident on that answer. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's how you deal with that. So I thought this was the last question. Julia, do you have a couple more? We'll do them real quick. We'll do them all at once if you have time. Okay. Um, the last question they had is also happens to be my last question, which is, Research is driven by government or academic grants and private sector use in the future. When do you think quantum computers will be commercially viable in their own right? And my question was the same, although shorter. Give us a timeline for commercialization. It's a, I'll give you an answer on that, that it's already the case. They're already being commercialized. We already have uh, an effort, and, and, and you say, well, what industry is consuming? Your, your commercial uh, offer is on quantum. The R&D sector. And you say, ah, R&D is not a sector. And you're like, yes, it is. It's like, what, 3.7% of GDP uh, in the United States is spent on, uh, on R&D. Um, I assure you that universities, national laboratories, industrial research organizations procure and pay their bills uh, on, uh, on uh, scientific and technological equipment. And quantum computers are a new scientific instrument of the first kind. So uh, IBM is in the business of uh, providing access, as we talked about, as a service, dedicated quantum computers, as well, as well as advisory and consulting services around use cases. So there's already a market and a segment that we're serving in the R&D world, uh, number one. And it's a significant and it's like growing very fast uh, on, on our end. Uh, and then beyond that, the next step will be beyond R&D, once we make sufficient progress and we make the right breakthroughs on that space, there will be then the phase of exploitation for commercial advantage, right? And, uh, and in that case, uh, quantum computers will be used in production in the same way that AI is being used in production today uh, or classical computing resources around that. But, but the answer it's not, and, you know, and I think this is a very important point, it's not like there's not a market today. There's definitely a market today and the market that you're serving is the market of R&D. And, um, and there's many companies uh, in the world uh, that participate with IBM Quantum because they have R&D efforts. And uh, if you are Boeing, I mean, as an example, if you say, hey, I have an R&D effort that is going to pay out in the next five years or seven years, totally within the normal planning horizon of many enterprises, mm -hmm. let alone if you're a national laboratory or a university. 
right? So all of those are customers and, uh, and partners and clients on a, on a quantum industry that exists today. So this is a great last question, and we touched on some of it, but we'll give you a final opportunity. If we could design congressional policy for quantum, um, which we can sort of do, but not with fidelity always, um, what should it focus on? Uh, funding, standards, R&D, uh, technology forcing. This is your big moment to tell Congress what it should do. Yeah, I kind of alluded to it before. I would focus on, on, doing, uh, on doing two things. Um, uh, reauthorize the National Quantum Initiative and make sure that the federal agencies beyond that have a very strong commitment to quantum information science. I'm talking about NSF, uh, I'm talking about DOE, NIST, and, and all the others, and within DOD as well. So that's, you know, number one, right? Is we're already doing that, but double down on that effort. And second, the technology has advanced such that we need to be ambitious and develop new national capabilities for the United States. And that should be in the form of we should go and build quantum supercomputers. We should be ambitious on that goal. There should be national level efforts. It's gonna bring the fields of communication and computation together. It's gonna to bring the best of academia, national laboratories and private sector together. And uh, it's gonna pay dividends, right, for many years and decades to come. So I would focus on those, those two objectives. Great, I think that pretty much wraps it up. So thank you very much for coming to CSIS. Thank Please you. Please thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.